Bonjour. Madison, fortunately, the last uh, word of French I will speak, so thank you very much for inviting me to uh, the conference today. And um, it really gave me a chance to reflect on some of the broader issues around occupational disease that um, at times in my day-to-day -day work I don't think about that much. So as I say, it was a real pleasure to be here with you. So first of all, um, my funding disclosures, our uh, Center for Research Expertise, the dollars actually do come from the WSAB, they flow through the Ontario Ministry of Labour, and we also have an occupational disease specialty program at St. Michael's Hospital, which is funded by the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, and where a lot of our research occurs. My setting, I think, is also important as far as my perspective is concerned. I'm physically, um, and most of my work occurs in a very multidisciplinary clinical environment where patient care, including the WSIB program, education not only of physicians but also of other health professionals and occupational hygienists, and research through our Center for Research Expertise are very much integrated. As I say, I'm going to focus on occupational skin disease, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about the importance of the case. So first of all, just some brief comments about occupational skin disease. Contact dermatitis is the most common occupational skin disease, accounts for 90 to 95% of it. As far as the types of contact dermatitis are concerned, the most common is irritant contact dermatitis, which is about 75%. The common causes are wet work, so any worker that has exposure to water wears gloves for more than two hours by day is by definition, at least according to the Germans, as somebody who is exposed to wet work. Cleansers, detergents, oils, greases, cutting fluids, solvents, acylite, alkalis, and acids. These are just some pictures. This is somebody with very mild irritant contact dermatitis. Um, here you can see it's a little, it's getting a little more severe. And this is a construction worker who has quite severe disease, mainly on his fingertips. But you get the sense there's a lot of scaling. There's some very deep cracking. Um, so those would be some common examples of irritant contact dermatitis. Allergic contact dermatitis accounts for about 25% of contact dermatitis. Again, a number of common workplace agents are common causes, including metals. The three common metals we see are nickel, chrome, and cobalt. A number of rubber accelerators and antioxidants. A variety of resins, epoxies, acrylic resins, fetal formaldehyde resins, biocides and germicides, which are in cutting fluids and cutting oils, and plants. And again, this is an individual who had uh, a dermatitis related to rubber materials. You can see there's a fairly sharp demarcation um, with his hands affected where he was wearing his gloves. And this is another construction worker who is actually allergic to chromium, which is still contained in cement in uh, Canada. And you can see he has very extensive disease. His hands are very swollen. There's a lot of cracking. And I think you would get the sense that he can barely move his hands. So not only can he not do his work, any activities involving his hands, and that's most of the things we do, would be very, very challenging for this individual. So although it may seem like it's only a little bit of a rash, what does it really matter? The reality is contact dermatitis can have a major impact on the worker's life. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about a case. I'm then going to do the kind of more formal part of the presentation and come back to the case at the end. This is a nurse. She had worked for three years as an operating room nurse and had no problems with her skin. She took two years off and then returned to work. The first year back, she started to develop some problems with her skin, but said, quote, they, were, they weren't severe enough to do anything about. And that's very common. You start to have a bit of a rash, just a bit of a rash, who cares, and you ignore it for a while. When it finally was serious enough to do something about, she consulted an anesthetist, who obviously was working with her in the operating rooms, um, who although they probably know a lot about anesthesia, probably don't know that much about skin disease. So anyway, that was her first medical consultation about her skin disease. She had exposure to a number of irritants, chlorhexidine, which is quite irritating. That was actually changed to betadine as uh, her scrubbing agent. She wore a variety of types of gloves, latex powder, non-powdered latex gloves, um, some non-latex powdered gloves with cotton liners, and cotton liners and polyethylene liners. So lots of different gloves. And she, when we asked her, she had had no specific training regarding skin hazards and how to protect her skin, even though she was working in an environment where there are a lot of skin hazards and hand hygiene is pretty important. Her rash was clearly associated with work. The more hours she worked, the worse it was. By the third year, it was severe enough that she actually took two weeks off work. She noticed significant improvement over that time, but within two weeks of returning to work, it had recurred and was severe again. So at this point, she was treated with topical medications. Here are some pictures which would be illustrative of her rash. So you can see there's um, a fair bit of inflammation. 
Here's another picture, you can see it up close. And yet another with a fairly deep crack. And again, you can see there's a little bit up her arms where her gloves would be. So she was patch tested, which is the way you diagnose allergic contact dermatitis by a community dermatologist, and she was found to be positive to rubbers, the typical rubber accelerators that you would find in the gloves she was using. However, the dermatologist didn't make any connection between those positive patch test results and her problem in her work. So there was no workplace intervention. The physician told the WSIB, because she had filed a claim, that it wasn't work-related, so her claim was denied, and she continued to work for a further year with ongoing problems and worsening of her condition. And finally, she was off work. She was seen in our clinic, further patch tested, was again confirmed to be positive to rubbers, and in fact her hands flared over the week of patch testing, which tends to actually add more diagnostic information to us that in fact the rubber positives were significantly associated with her hand dermatitis. So she ended up with a diagnosis of occupational allergic and occupational irritant contact dermatitis. In spite of return to work intervention, we have an occupational therapist in our clinic who works on return to work. Six months after that final diagnosis, she was not working. Her skin condition was not significantly better. She was continuing to use topical medications and emollients. She was using vinyl gloves with cotton liners for her housework. She was very self-conscious about her skin, and she noted a loss of income. So as I say, we'll come back to her at the end of the presentation, but that's a very typical presentation of patients I see on a weekly basis in our clinic. So what actually is occupational disease? And one of the challenges I think we have with occupational disease is there are lots of definitions, and it depends on your setting as to how you define it. So there are broad general definitions, such as the ILO would provide. There are administrative and legal definitions, which we would use in our various provinces. There are epidemiological definitions. And finally, there are clinical definitions. So the ILO WHO definition is occupational disease is any disease contracted as a result of an exposure to risk factors arising from work activity. So pretty broad. In Ontario, we have two administrative definitions. Under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, and it's actually called occupational illness in this case, means a condition that results from exposure in a workplace to a physical, chemical, or biological agent to the extent that the normal physiological mechanisms are affected and the health of the worker is impaired thereby and which includes an occupational disease for which the worker is entitled under the Workplace Safety and Insurance Act. And the Ministry of Labor does require reporting of occupational disease to the Ministry of Labor, so the reality is this definition actually should have some meaning in the province because employers are required to report. The Workplace Safety and Insurance Act has a much more lengthy definition of occupational disease, a disease resulting from exposure to a substance relating to a particular process, trade, or occupation in an industry, a disease peculiar to or characteristic of a particular industrial process, trade or occupation, a medical condition that in the opinion of the board requires a worker to be removed either temporarily or permanently from exposure to a substance because the condition may be a precursor to an occupational disease. This would be somebody, for instance, with elevated blood lead levels where they may not be frankly ill yet, but because their blood levels are going up, you would remove them from exposure. And any disease mentioned in several schedules um, which accompany the act. So you can see even in our two um, key government organizations, we have different definitions. And while you might come up with a very similar list applying the definitions, and done the list, they're different. And then we move into things maybe closer to some of us, epidemiological studies. And I'm talking here about studies that are using administrative data or are collecting or using data that has already been collected. And typically in an epidemiological study, you will come up at with a case definition of what you're going to define as the disease or outcome of interest. It may include people reporting various symptoms, having particular clinical findings, and also some made to measure exposure. And the reality is, unfortunately, virtually with any disease you're talking about, nobody uses that same case definition, or it's very hard to get a group to come together and agree on a case definition. So I just give you one citation, a very recent publication, where they, in fact, looked at the differences in epidemiological case definitions on the prevalence of upper extremity MSK disorders. And basically, the results of the paper were, depending on how you, you define it, the uh, prevalence is very, very different. So even just within the epidemiological sphere, the case definition matters a lot. And then we get to the clinical sphere, where we actually are making a diagnosis of a disease to treat a patient or worker. And in the clinical context, typically we have documentation of the causative workplace agent. That may be based on exposure history, very rarely you might have some testing information. You also have to diagnose the disease and then you have to link the disease and the agent. 
And although that may seem fairly straightforward to do, the reality is that provides lots of challenges. So in summary, the definition varies very much depending on the setting in which you're working. And one can certainly appreciate that as we cross those settings, it may get very confusing for practitioners who practice their, whether it's they're an epidemiologist or a clinician or you're working, say, at the compensation board, it means different things to you. So for the clinician who has a patient who has a claim with the compensation board, the clinician doesn't understand the board's concern about all those kind of very legalistic definitions, but that's very important to the compensation board. So as I say, we have many definitions and it can be very confusing. So the ILO um, publishes a lot of information around occupational disease and um, a question might be how is an occupational disease recognized? So the ILO publishes a list of occupational diseases, and I was asked to talk about this, and it's interesting because although I know the ILO has a list of occupational diseases, I never use it in my day-to-day -day work and activity. So it was actually interesting for me to go back and reflect on that. So it provides a definition, which I've already given you. Um, they also provide criteria for the identification and recognition of occupational diseases broadly. And these are things um, that we would commonly use in epidemiology to define causation, so things like tempor temporality, biological plausibility, factors like that. Then they have criteria for the identification and recognition of an individual occupational disease. And they talk about kind of two ways where you end up with that list of specific er, diseases. One where you actually have a list that's agreed to. The second is you have a broader definition and you kind of by a case by case basis decide. And the reality is most jurisdictions use a combination of that. They have a list. They may use the ILO list, they may use their own list, like we do in Ontario, we have our own list. Plus you have a mechanism for um, really defining on a case-by-case -case basis an occupational disease. And they also provide criteria for how an occupational disease actually gets incorporated into their list. And it's a fairly lengthy process. It involves um, a tripartite um, really activity between employers, workers, and the ILO and government um, organizations. But the reality is many jurisdictions have their own specific lists. Um, and so I was actually chatting with our um, Director of Occupational Disease Policy at the WSIB, and I said to her, I'm giving this talk, and I was looking at the ILO list, kind of like, what do we do about it in Ontario? And she says, interesting question. Probably be really good if we used it. Um, but whether there's any appetite to actually consider that, I have no idea. But anyway, so the reality is there may be a number of lists of occupational diseases, but again, they tend to vary jurisdiction by jurisdiction. So again, coming back to occupational skin disease, there are four um, categories of occupational skin disease included in the ILO list, allergic contact dermatitis and urticaria, irritant contact dermatitis, vitiligo, and then a category of other skin diseases, which include a number of diseases. So I would be very comfortable with that list. It's the list I would tend to use if I'm giving a talk about occupational skin disease. So contact dermatitis, to use the list, so it said like allergic contact dermatitis, irritant contact dermatitis, but we still need to define that somehow. So to me, in my clinical world, contact dermatitis is a reactive eczematous inflammation of the skin provoked by direct contact with an environmental chemical or substance. It's a pretty broad definition. And again, it doesn't tell me how I'm actually going to get there. So Toby Mathias, who's an occupational dermatologist in the United States, um, actually now probably at 25, 30 years ago, actually came up with a set of criteria uh, to use to make the diagnosis of contact dermatitis. There are seven criteria, so things like is the clinical appearance consistent with contact dermatitis, are there workplace exposures to potential irritants or allergens, is the anatomic distribution consistent with the form of exposure in relation to the job task, what's the temporal relationship, between disease onset. Are non-occupational exposures excluded? Because many of the causes which I showed you, you also have exposure to in your non-work life. Does removal from exposure lead to improvement? And do patch or provocation tests impl implement a specific workplace exposure? So that's actually a very nice set of questions um, to use in a diagnostic process. The problem is do clinicians actually use them? 
And I would say that even our experts in occupational dermatology, they probably kind of have something like that that they go through. But do they go through that list and very explicitly answer those questions? I don't think so. So we have, again, the problem, even though we have, for this one specific occupational disease, um, a really good, and, and his criteria have been validated, um, they're not necessarily used in day-to-day -day practice. So there's yet another kind of place where the link can uh, fall through the caps. So bottom line is lots of definitions, and depending on where you're working, um, that will influence how you define the disease. So how common are they? So the ILO has uh, published a Global Burden for Occupational Disease. Um, approximately 2 million deaths per year are linked to occupational disease, so a large, large number of deaths. Um, and then 160 million cases of non-fatal work-related disease a year. So large, large numbers. So it was interesting in um, meeting in uh, Frankfurt this summer, a writer who's the director general of the ILO made a really good point, which is statistics can blind us to the humans behind the statistics. And I think to me, kind of those millions and millions is just overwhelming. Um, I hear it, but it still doesn't kind of really touch me. So when I hear about that case, that's when it becomes more real to me. So I think one of the challenges with statistics are they kind of, as numbers are impressive, but they are, they're so big, it's hard for us to know what they really mean. So where does our information come from about occupational disease? It comes from a variety of sources. It can come from administrative data, so a number of jurisdictions have a requirement for reporting to various government organizations. It comes from workers' compensation claims. It could come from clinical populations workplace populations, or from population-based studies. And each of those sources, not surprisingly, provides us with very different information. They're collected for different purposes using different definitions, as we've already talked about. So um, for those of you who've seen the uh, October 2014 um, issue of the American Journal of Industrial Medicine, its entire focus is on the challenge of counting occupational injuries and diseases. However, so I was very excited. I got, oh, this is perfect. I'm doing this talk, and here's it is. But it's focused almost entirely on injuries. The comment they make is occupational disease is essentially absent. Let's look a little more at the administrative data for occupational skin disease. So in Europe, um, and um, there's, a, there's a lot of very good um, work, epidemiological work, clinical work, um, return to work done in Europe around occupational skin disease. Um, so in Europe overall, um, there are five to 10 cases per 10,000 workers per year, newly reported occupational skin disease. In Germany, um, where they've looked at it very closely, 6.7 to 6.8 cases per 10,000 workers. And Thomas Diepken, who's one of the leading um, occupational derm uh, epidemiologists, says that I'll know, although the number of unreported cases is presumably much higher, and he estimates 50 to 100 times higher. So even though um, kind of they, they actually can track it, the reality is everybody thinks that it is a significant underrepresentation. So that's Europe. The other interesting thing is Germany has looked at its trends. In 1960, there were 6,000 cases reported. In 1990, 20,000 cases. So that's actually interesting, because in most jurisdictions, kind of reporting both for injuries and disease is tending to go down. And it's very much attributed to um, them implementing a much stricter reporting system and financial incentives um, to help that. So it's interesting, they actually saw an increase in skin diseases. So what about North America? So the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, is probably our key um, United States source. Um, they report occupational disease. So in 2010, there were 34,000 recordable skin diseases, which was a rate of 3.4 per 10,000 workers. I'll just note that uh, the respiratory rates were 19 th or 1.9. Um, I think people um, kind of tend to think that respiratory illness is pretty common as an occupational disease, but um, when you actually kind of have numbers, skin disease tends to be more common than respiratory disease. And in 2012, which were the most recent figures I saw, the rate was 3.2 per 10,000. So you can see it's about half what's being reported in Europe. And let's move on to Canada. And I have um, WSIB figures. So these are the allowed dermatitis claims from 1993 to 2005. So you can see kind of they were hovering about 400 claims a year. The rate is about 0.1 per 100 workers. 
and then we had an increase. And um, this actually related to a lot of work. I was actually at the WSIB at this point in time. We did a fair bit of work around occupational disease, occupational disease awareness and recognition, which may have accounted in part for that spike. And this just shows the distribution by sector. The blue bars are all claims submitted, and the darker colored are allowed claims. So you can see there are a lot of claims that actually aren't actually um, accepted. Um, there are a variety of reasons for that, which we can talk about if we want to. But you can see manufacturing is the major source, automotive, which is quite similar to manufacturing, the service sector, where there are a lot of wet workers. This would include um, food service, hairdressers, and then healthcare. So, um, a lot fewer claims being reported in the Ontario context than we've seen from the European numbers. So diving into the WSIB statistics a bit more, um, if we looked at claims from 2008 to 2012 in the healthcare, education, municipal, and government sectors, there were a just over 1,000 dermatitis claims, which was about 25% uh, of all the dermatitis claims across all sectors, so about 1,000 claims a year in those four kind of subsectors. So that's approximately 200 claims per year across the four sectors. And now we'll talk about some other sources of data. So there's a fair bit reported from patch test centers then. Patch testing is a fairly specialized process, and what tends to happen are there are centers um, in Quebec, uh, Denny Sassville in Montreal, and Marie-Claude Houle in uh, Quebec City are the two main occupational dermatologists um, who have active patch test uh, clinics. They see very selected um, populations of patients, and they often report kind of, you know, this is the prevalence of irritant or allergic contact dermatitis. The, the reality is I think those numbers are actually pretty useless because, as I say, there's so much referral bias um, in their populations. But what they can do, because they patch test large numbers of individuals, is they can track the prevalence of positives to various substances and trends in allergens. So, I would, for example, this comes from European data. There are two allergens which we've seen a significant increase in patch test positive results when you report group results. One is epoxies, and that's because epoxies are being used in a number of new applications, particularly in construction, um, and we're seeing basically a little mini epidemic of epoxy allergic contact dermatitis. And the other is methyl isothiazolone, which is uh, used in biocides and germicides, um, is being now actually regulated in Europe in the use in cosmetics and skincare products, but isn't necessarily as regulated on the workplace side. And a very specific example of methyl isothiazolone, as I say, it's a, it's a biocide germicide. As people have moved from oil-based to water-based paints, if it's water-based, you need something to control the potential bugs that might grow in those paints, and you use things like methyl isothiazolone. So as I say, the patch test clinic data I don't think tells us much about what's going on in general about irritant or allergic contact dermatitis, but I think can give us some very good information if the information is pooled and tracked about trends in allergen um, positivity and can point us to particular sectors in industry where those trends seem to be going up and we can look at what the processes are. And then there are workplace studies. And, uh, I've done a number of workplace studies over my career, and I think they actually can be very helpful. But they're hard to do, and they tend to be expensive. You actually have to get into a workplace and get everybody agree to do them. Um, and in the case of dermatitis, you may need to patch test people, which takes three days over a five-day period. So um, they're not that many done. So from an occupational skin disease perspective, there have been a number of studies done in the healthcare sector. Of course, each study uses a slightly different definition as an epidemiological study will, what's its case definition of an occupational skin disease. So with that in mind, um, the reality is there have been several large studies published in the last few years, uh, one from Denmark where the one-year prevalence was 21%, and a study from Hong Kong where it was 22%. So these are nurses um, primarily. So fairly high prevalence, around 20%. We in the last year did a study in a very large healthcare institution in Ontario. Only 28%, and this was based on clinical examination of the individual plus um, survey results, only 28% were defined to have normal skin. 59% had mild changes, which you might say, oh, it's just a bit of dryness or whatever, but nonetheless they had some skin changes. And 13% had mild to severe changes in their skin. So that's pretty significant numbers. Go to a hospital. There are 13% of people who have significant, moderate to mo severe changes in their skin, in their hands. 
Now, we don't necessarily know that they're all work-related, but that's still a lot of individuals. And then when you add those mild ones on top, the numbers are starting to get very large. And think about that number of claims per year in Ontario, 200 per year. Healthcare is one of those sectors. This large institution probably has at least 10,000 workers in it. So you calculate, even if you take the 13%, how many people we should be seeing. And let's be, say only a quarter of them have work-related problems. There should be a claim filed for those individuals. So I think it points out very clearly that the use of compensation statistics really gives us no true idea about what's actually happening as far as at least some occupational diseases. There are very, very few population-based studies of hand dermatitis. Um, there was a famous one in uh, Sweden. Um, Jacob Thiessen has reviewed them and has come up with these, um, these uh, prevalence values, so a point prevalence of 4%, uh, a one-year prevalence of 10%, and a lifetime prevalence of 15% for hand dermatitis. So there's actually, in a sense, what we really need, which is what's the population base of these problems, so then when we actually have information from a workplace, we can say, is it the same as that background population level, or is it, in fact, increased? But getting population-based level of these things, again, is often a challenge. So, as I say, the bottom line is we have some information. It's all over the map. And I think it's really hard, particularly when you're using administrative data, to think that this really is truly representing the burden of occupational disease, whichever one it may be. So why is it important? I mean, why do we spend our time worrying about these statistics? Well, it's important for a number of reasons. For the worker, it's very important because as long as they are misdiagnosed and it's not recognized that their skin disease is related to their work, they will be treated medically, but the workplace exposures and conditions that cause their problem won't necessarily be managed. And until those workplace conditions are changed in some fashion, um, the worker is likely to have ongoing disease. So just from a basic disease perspective, it's a significant issue as our nurse exemplified. It can have loss of function. The construction worker I showed you, um, I think, is a very kind of clear example of that. Um, quality of life studies have consistently confirmed a reduced quality of life, and there are obviously economic uh, losses for the worker. For the employer, it's also a problem. We've done some work looking um, at groups of our workers with contact dermatitis, looking at productivity, um, and there's no question that even if they are still at work, um, their productivity is decreased. Um, often as they are leaving the workplace, taking time off, so their staff turnover costs. And because it's not recognized as work-related, um, the workplace in general doesn't implement prevention strategies um, that might help both that individual worker, but also help prevent um, other workers from developing the disease. It's a problem for the healthcare system. Um, in the healthcare system, if it's not identified as a compensation case, the um, in Ontario, OHIP pays, continues to pay those costs, so those costs are misallocated. There are additional costs because you keep having to treat the person, because you haven't really done the right intervention to solve their problem. And also, I think on the part of healthcare providers, they get really frustrated, because they keep seeing these individuals and they're not getting better, um, and so the provider gets frustrated, and then if they're also dealing with the compensation board, that can be frustrating as well for healthcare providers. So, impact on the healthcare system. And finally, on the system as a whole, on its a whole, it's um, important. So first of all, the costs, again, are misallocated to the general health care system in the Canadian context. But the other real problem, from my perspective, if the numbers are small, if the number of cases reported to the WSIB are small, um, it's not seen as a problem and therefore is not a system priority. So in Ontario, if we look at our WSIB statistics, which tends to drive the Ministry of Labor enforcement activities and prevention activities, it's injuries and musculoskeletal problems. Um, occupational diseases, maybe 5%. The numbers for any one disease are pretty small. So they don't see it as a priority in the system. So again, from a system perspective, we're not going to see this as an important thing to either think about from a legislation, enforcement, um, or other activity. And the ILO um, suggests that, the, that annually there's a 4% loss in G GDP, which in the U.S. would be $2.8 trillion in U.S. dollars. So again, a significant uh, economic impact. So why is there this gap? And I tend to look at it as there's under-recognition and under-reporting. So under-recognition is, I would say, common in every part of the system. Everybody's not very aware. So from a worker and employer perspective, they don't realize it's a problem. If the Ministry of Labor, when their inspectors are out there, aren't asking questions about various exposures that might cause occupational disease, 
employer's not going to think it's a problem. The worker won't hear about it. It's not in their training programs. Um, they don't even know it exists, that occupational disease exists in a number of cases. So if they don't know there's a problem, they're probably not going to implement any prevention activities to try to prevent it. And the other thing is, when that worker or the employer sends that worker to a healthcare provider, if they don't think there's any relationship with work, they're not likely to tell the healthcare provider about their work. And therefore, again, that will add to the lack of recognition of the problem. So there's problems in the worker and employer side. There's also under-recognition in the healthcare side, and I'm, I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about health, the healthcare perspective. So again, the healthcare provider doesn't realize there's a potential work-related problem. Many of them don't take an occupational history, and even if they do, they don't make the link. So think back to our nurse. So a dermatologist actually patch tested the person, actually came up with a very obvious, from my perspective, uh, workplace allergen, didn't know the relationship between that exposure and the work exposures, and so the link wasn't made. So the healthcare provider can be a significant kind of link or dislink in the recognition system. And finally, as I say, from a system perspective, certainly in Ontario, as our activity is driven by WSIB statistics, it appears that there's very little problem with occupational disease because there just aren't a, a large number of claims. And that leads to a lack of regulatory activity, both potentially in laws and regulations, but also enforcement. So when the Ministry of Labor inspectors in Ontario are out in the workplace, they're going to be looking for broad things, training, ergonomic issues, things like that. But they're very unlikely to be looking for some of the specific exposures and hazards that might be related to occupational disease. So even if the problem is recognized, so all, in spite of all of kind of those potentials for lack of recognition, even if it's recognized, it may be underreported. And this again can occur in all of those various steps. So from the worker's perspective, they just may not want to bother. It's too much hassle to have to kind of do that paperwork and whatever. And for a number of workers, um, there's a real fear of reprisals. Workers that are working in small industry, vulnerable workers, um, non-unionized workers, um, may very often feel that they are going to be fired if they submit a claim to the compensation board. And we certainly see that in our clinical practice. We'll be seeing a worker. To us, it's a very clear work-related problem. It's kind of, there's just absolutely no question. Uh, you know, it's a worker, say, that's had um, exposure to epoxy that's clearly documented in the material safety data sheets. They're allergic to epoxy on patch testing, and yet they do not want a claim file because they're sure they're going to get fired. Um, so um, that's a problem from the worker perspective. From the employer perspective, um, there's a lot of um, conversation and work being done around claim suppression, but I think there's no question, again, that employers, um, again, at times may want to suppress claims, do not want to report claims. The healthcare provider, even if they recognize it, um, a lot of healthcare providers don't understand the workers' compensation system. They're highly frustrated by the system. There are lots of forms to fill in. They never hear back what happens to their worker. Um, I'm doing a study right now with Catherine uh, LaPelle and Joan Eakin, and we're comparing Ontario and Quebec um, and the physician role in the system. And it's been really interesting for me because um, the systems actually are quite different. Um, in Quebec, as I understand it, um, the CSST is bound by the physician's um, basically findings. In Ontario, that's not the case at all. Um, you know, the board receives the physician's report, but the board can choose to basically ignore it and come up with a different decision. So um, there's some interesting, even between the two provinces, some differences. Um, so as I say in Ontario, um, if you're a physician and you just say you think it's work-related and you send it into the board and for whatever reason they don't, um, you can be pretty frustrated. You know, here I've got a patient, I think it's clearly, and yet why isn't the compensation board accepting this claim? And then also workers' compensation board practices. So what are the requirements for documentation, for proof, and things like that? So there are a variety of reasons why, um, even if the work-related problem is recognized, it may not be reported and end up in those statistics that we use. Um, if you look at the literature more broadly, um, and this is, again, work that I did with Joan Eakin, and look at it kind of from a more sociologic perspective, um, the literature sent, tends to kind of look at three major groups um, of issues. So physician and diagnosis-related challenges, which we've talked about, workplace dynamics and social relationships, which we've talked about a bit, that's the reprisals, um, and some structural determinants in the system. Joan, uh, Ron House, and uh, Dana House and I did a study where we 
uh, looked at underreporting and underrecognition, and again grouped those findings into kind of three clusters: psychosocial, social, psychosocial factors, workplace cultural factors, and systemic and structural factors. So, unfortunately, it's not just one or two things where, if you could really kind of target it and do something about it, there are all kinds of things which one would need to uh, kind of look at and try to improve uh, to make this work better as far as recognizing and reporting occupational disease. So I want to focus in a little bit on healthcare providers. Um, we've done a fair bit of work with healthcare providers, and they are one of the key links in the system because um, they have to make the diagnosis. And as a healthcare provider myself, <laughs> I feel that I can maybe say this. So first of all, a lot of us don't know. We just don't know about occupational disease. We don't ask the patients we see about their work. Even if we do, we don't make the link. We don't know how to confirm the diagnosis, and then we don't report it. So even within that one little piece, there are all kinds of places where uh, there can be problems. So we've done uh, several studies looking at um, health care utilization, health services um, in occupational skin disease. Uh, this is um, a survey work we did, family doctors, dermatologists, and we actually did um, respirologists as well, so there's a companion piece to this around respirology and occupational asthma. But first of all, we have done a number of studies where we've asked the worker about their understanding of what happened in their health care interactions. So when we asked workers, did your family doctor ask you about your job, just your job? 67%, so about two thirds said yes, they did. Did they ask you any further information about what you were exposed to at work? Only 3% said the physician did. So if somebody says I'm a laborer, doesn't really tell you much about what their exposures are unless you actually ask a detail. So what actually do you do and what are you exposed to? And then when the workers visit their dermatologists, they say only about half of the dermatologists ask me about my job, like what's my job title. And again, 5% asked actually about specific information about exposures. So from the workers' perception of their interaction with their healthcare provider, although 50 to two thirds of them may ask something about their job, very, very few ask any detail about their actual workplace exposures. So then, as I say, we did a study where we said, okay, so that's the worker's perspective of, of what's going on in this interaction, what do providers say? And um, as I said, there's also information about this for respirologists. So here's the question. I ask about work history always or most of the time. 57% of family docs say they do. 92% of dermatologists say they do. So those numbers are a bit different than what the worker's reporting. And again, we don't know what truth is, but there is a bit of a gap. So we actually did a little probing on these things. So we said, well, if you don't ask, why not? I don't know about it. I, I don't have enough time. Family docs admitted they just forget to ask. And for dermatologists, the lack of adequate reimbursement and the issue of having to fill out forms um, were other reasons why they don't ask about work history. So then we said, OK, if you suspect somebody has allergic contact dermatitis, to make a diagnosis of allergic contact dermatitis, you really have to do patch testing. So do you diagnose this yourself? 13% of family doctors said they do. They always diagnose it themselves. That's pretty amazing, because I don't know any family doctors that do patch testing. And 77% they said they sometimes do, which again is pretty interesting. Dermatologists, 11% said they always make the diagnosis themselves, and 64% sometimes. So if you do make it yourself, why do you do it? So family docs say, I feel competent to diagnose it myself. I can't get access to the dermatologists in the community to do the testing, so I just do it myself. Um, or I can't get access to them in a timely fashion. Dermatologists, I feel competent to diagnose it myself. I can't get access to people like our clinic, where again, we can do very extensive patch testing, or they just enjoy doing it. So lots of reasons why they diagnose it themselves. But as I say, the reality is to truly make a diagnosis of allergic contact dermatitis, you need to do patch testing. And I suspect most of these folks aren't doing patch testing. So then we put the other question out. So if you do refer individuals out, why do you do that? So family physician said, I don't have the expertise, I can't do the testing, um, and I don't know about the WSIB process, and so therefore that's why I want somebody else to do it. And dermatologists, I don't again have the patch testing um, capability, and the reality is a minority of dermatologists actually do any patch testing, it takes too long to do, and I'm not adequately paid for it. So then we said, well, what, what kind of, give us a sense about your knowledge, kind of what education would you like? So about a third of family docs thought their knowledge was good or excellent, and about 70% of them wanted further education. For dermatologists, two-thirds thought their knowledge was excellent. 
are good, and about, again, 70% wanted further education. So then we said, well, if you don't want education, why not? I don't see enough patients. The reality is they probably actually are seeing a fair number of those patients. They just don't recognize it. It takes too long and I have access to specialists. So for the dermatologist in Toronto, where there are several centers that do a lot of patch testing, um, it takes a lot of time to do it. Dermatology is a high volume practice. Um, if you can send it out somewhere, that would be great. And um, the notion also then I don't have to deal with the compensation board. We have a respirologist at St. Mike's who will always send his folks to us because it's like, you know, kind of, although I could do it, I don't wanna have to deal with the compensation board. You can do that, that's what you do. Um, so that gives you a sense of kind of the history taking, um, the diagnostic process from both the worker's perception of what happens and the practitioner's perception of what happens. So a little more about healthcare. So who do you actually see? So about two thirds of individuals had, saw a family physician as the first contact. Almost 20% saw a walk-in clinic and 6% actually visited the emergency department as their first visit for their skin disease. And then how many times do you see your family physician? So we've done several studies of this. This 2000 study we did, the median number of visits was three, but the range was from one to 90. So one patient reported that they had seen their family doctor 90 times for their skin disease before they actually moved on to some further diagnosis. Now that's obviously an exception, but if the median number of visits is three, there are a number of individuals that are seeing their family doctor many, many times for this problem without resolution. Dermatologists, again, the median number of visits to their dermatologist before being referred on uh, for definitive testing was three with a range from one to 50. Um, so again, there are a number of people that are seeing their dermatologists a fair number of times without getting a definitive diagnosis. And so how long does that take so again, in our two th or we did a study in the 1980s, the mean uh, months to diagnosis, so onset of symptoms to diagnosis was 50, so just over four years. The 2000 study, the mean was just over two years. In our most recent study, the mean was 61 months, so it was actually higher, um, but the median was 18 months. So the reality is um, there are a group of individuals that end up spending a lot of time in the healthcare system or for themselves delay seeking care. So there were 20% which waited over a year from the onset of symptoms to their first assessment and visit to a healthcare provider. So we've got potentially large gaps of time between onset of symptoms and diagnosis. So does that matter? So first of all, I'll talk about why do people not seek care? So I thought it would get better. You know, it's a bit of a rash, oh well, I won't worry about it, it'll get better. It's not serious enough. The symptoms aren't limiting my work or other activities. A number of people said I'm concerned about missing work to go to the doctor's appointments, or they thought their symptoms were a natural consequence of work. And what would I do about it anyway? So those are the reasons why they delayed seeking care. What tended to drive them to seek care was it didn't get better, or it started to interfere with their work or other activities. So does that time factor matter? And the answer is yes. And this is similar to other things, certainly for occupational asthma, I think it, the same kind of has been proven. The earlier the diagnosis and appropriate management, the better the outcome. So in studies we've done, individuals that had had their rash for less than a year when they were seen and had their definitive diagnosis, over half of them improved on follow-up. Whereas if they'd had their rash for greater a year, only a quarter of them improved. And a similar study done um, by Malconan's group, um, again, less than a year, just half of them improved. Greater than 10 years, only 21% improved. So it matters, the timeliness of making the diagnosis matters. So we have providers who variably take histories, seem to be making the diagnosis themselves even though they actually can't do, aren't doing the testing. Um, we have workers that wait a period of time before they seek any care, then seem to end up seeing providers a number of times before the definitive diagnosis comes. That all means an extended period of time between onset of problem, definitive diagnosis and management, poor outcomes for the workers. And as I say, although I'm talking about dermatitis, I think you can apply that to a number of certainly the non-malignant occupational diseases. So I would say our goal is early recognition and diagnosis. Um, as I've reflected over the years, I originally thought like every doctor should know all about this and really be doing everything. Um, with age, I've become maybe a little more um, reflective about it. I think the key role of the family physician is recognizing the possibility.
to recognize the possibility that it might be related to work. And then they need to figure out how that diagnosis is going to be made. So you need the specialist group, or at least a subset of your specialist group, who can actually do the definitive diagnosis. So whether, as I say, in Quebec, um, for occupational skin disease, it's Denny Sassville and Marie-Claude Houle. If you're in Montreal and have occupational asthma, now that John Luke's retired, you'll have to see Catherine or uh, Andre or somebody else. But um, you need a group of specialists who really know how to do this well. The family docs, I think, key function for a lot of occupational disease is recognizing the possibility. I think the other thing is kind of what are their educational needs. The reality is family physicians, primary care providers have to deal with all kinds of things. Every time I go to a lecture on kind of whatever topic is, the final solution is, well, if the family physician would just ask about this, ask this short five item questionnaire, like this would be much better. So I don't, I don't know how we can kind of deal with that because they've got so many things on their plate. So I think again, for the family physician, it's kind of general knowledge about p the potential of work-relatedness, and then as you get more specialized, you need the specific knowledge. And then people need practical information. How can I make a referral to those very specialized places? And how can you help me with the workers' compensation process, help me work through that system? So now I want to turn um, in the last period and looking at prevention. And I'm focused here on primary prevention. There's obviously secondary and tertiary prevention, but thinking primary prevention. So there's a hierarchy of controls. I'm sure most of you are familiar with those. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about them because I think there's something that exists even before this that I really want to focus on in the last few minutes. So does prevention actually happen in the workplace? So we see workers um, with possible contact dermatitis, and we routinely collect data. Basically, every worker we see who consents, we collect some basic prevention uh, practice data, and then we do some very deep dives into our data. So we have a current study in place. We so far have 127 workers enrolled, 44, about half of them are male, from the manufacturing and healthcare sectors primarily, about half are unionized, and 86% report wearing gloves in the workplace to protect their skin. What training have they had? 75, 80% report they've had general health and safety training and women's training, both absolute requirements under our Occupational Health and Safety Act. Only a half have said they have had any training about skin exposures and skin protection, and a third have had education about glove use. So we're not even hitting our basic targets around general health and safety training, but when you look at skin prevention, it's much less. Of those who've received training, so that 50% who've received some training, what, was, what did they get trained about? Heard a lot about avoiding exposure and hand washing. Reasonable um, amount received information about glove use, the use of protective creams. One of the things which they don't hear about and they say is really important is hearing about what are the early symptoms. So like, if something's starting to be a problem, what should I be looking for and knowing about? So that's a clear gap in training programs that we might want to address. But I think prevention starts for us at awareness, or to put it differently, a lack of awareness. So we've been working with our, so one of, the, one of the mandates of our research center is to work with our health and safety system partners. Um, so we've worked with um, the health and safety associations in Ontario. And this work was done with the services sector to look at skin disease and awareness and prevention. We used focus groups initially and then an electronic survey of both advisory committee members to the service sector. Um, these are representatives, primarily employer representatives from various uh, industries within the sector. And we also surveyed the um, service sector uh, staff of the HSA that provide consulting and prevention services to that sector in the province. So here are some very basic results. Do you think skin disease is a problem in the sector? Only a fifth of the advisory committee, this is the services sector, these have all the food services workers, the hairdressers, the vehicle sales and service workers. Only a fifth of them think skin disease is a problem in their sector. From a staff perspective, almost all of them think it's a problem. And then we said, do you think the sector sees it as a problem? The advisory committee, again, 18%, that's pretty good. Kind of, they either know it is and they think it is. The staff of the HSA, so these are the folks that are actually out in those industries visiting, less than 10% of them think the sector knows that skin disease is a problem in the sector. What's your level of knowledge about skin disease and prevention? So the advisory committee, about 20% of them said they they're, would have moderate to expert knowledge. Less than half of the staff of the uh, Health and Safety Association think they have expert knowledge. And what do you think the service sector um, level of knowledge is? The advisory committee says the sector, nobody has good or expert knowledge about this problem. And the staff say 
So A, we don't think it's a problem, and B, we really don't know anything about it at any particular level. What are the barriers? The advisory committee said lack of knowledge. It's not a priority. Again, going back to those WSIB statistics, because it doesn't show up there, the Ministry of Labor doesn't recognize it, therefore the industry doesn't recognize it because it's not the focus of inspection. When they see the Ministry of Labor inspection, they're not talking about skin problems, they're talking about slips, trips, and falls and things like that. They say there aren't training materials, that it would take time to train people, it's expensive to train people, and then there are issues around management support and culture. The Health and Safety Association staff raised the same set of issues, but added two others, which again are interesting, and demonstrate their, their kind of slightly more sophisticated um, perception of this. First of all, they recognize that skin disease has non-work-related causes, so you do have a diagnostic challenge, so not everybody that has skin disease is it work-related. And then they also recognize that healthcare providers don't recognize occupational skin disease. So we've obviously got a problem. And so moving further, as I say, the health and safety associations are one of our key provincial um, prevention delivery organizations. So we thought we would actually, again, work with their frontline consultants, their individuals, again, who are out in industry providing these services to try to identify and assess gaps in awareness, knowledge, skills, and resources um, and explore potential val barriers around occupational disease generally and skin disease specifically to inform the development of educational materials. So we did eight fo focus groups, two from each of the four HSAs, 64 participants. Um, we did a brief survey to get to uh, capture the basic demographic information and then a focus group. And then we had a facilitated workshop with 20 health and safety system partners to review the data and suggest next steps. So what are the results? What are the challenges of addressing occupational disease, occupational skin disease? The reality is prevention in Ontario is driven by the Ministry of Labor and its priorities. It's top four safety hazards, injuries and accidents, not disease. In Ontario, um, about 20 years ago, we had um, much more um, fulsome health and safety uh, requirements for training, for certification training for Joint Health and Safety Committee members. Um, there was occupational health, occupational disease content, and um, a number of these consultants um, really wanted to return to those good old days where occupational disease was actually included in training for Joint Health and Safety Committee members. They felt there was inadequate knowledge of prevention, a need for awareness, um, their challenge of serving a variety of workplaces, everything from the small workplace with vulnerable workers to the very large, sophisticated workplace with lots of health and safety resources. And the health and safety system in Ontario, there had been 12 sector-based HSAs. They had been consolidated into four. So they were also having um, issues of their own. So what did they say they needed? They said we need quick and easy access in a central repository to information. We need to trust the source. So these individuals came from those 12 legacy organizations. They trusted the information their legacy organization had produced. They didn't necessarily trust information others produced. Or they went to colleagues. It needed to be applicable and applied. It needed to be sector specific. And they also suggested that maybe they should develop some core competencies that they should have around OD and occupational skin disease. We also asked them about research, and this is kind of interesting for those of us that do research. They're generally not aware of research. Keeping up with it is challenging. They generally don't use it. They don't have time. They refer to experts, and they have challenge accessing research. So it was a bit sobering for us who are kind of out there producing information that they're not actually using it, or maybe we're not, it's not being produced in a way that makes it usable for them. Barriers um, of addressing skin disease, lack of awareness and knowledge, this focus on safety, lack of legislation and enforcement, the issue around workplace culture, lacks, lack of valid statistics, a shrinking pool of health and safety experts with knowledge about occupational disease, a fact that they're not linked into their business plans, issue fatigue and cost. So what we've done is start to develop some resources. So we've worked on, first of all, awareness posters. We started with a positive and negative image poster. Um, you can see, so this is the positive image, kind of nice clear skin. Um, this you may not see it well, but this is a worker that has skin disease. We took those two pictures out to um, several large meetings and said, which do you like? Equal split. Half the people thought the positive poster was what really spoke to them, half of them thought it was the negative poster. And they had suggestions for the format. So what we decided to do was make a series of seven posters um, that um, all have the same look and feel but contain the core messaging. 
This is a set developed for the restaurant and food services sector. So you can see in the background, this is in a kitchen. This is the negative image poster, the worker with skin disease. Here's the nice healthy skin. And you can see there's kind of these uh, taglines down the sides of each poster. They're consistent on the poster. This is early recognition. Things you handle at work put you at risk. Speak to your doctor. Use the right personal protective equipment. Again, it's a health services, or sorry, it's a food services image. Skin matters, keep it clean. And avoid, know the hazards, avoid exposure. So this is obviously a person exposed to wet work. So you can see that there are different messages in the poster, but they're very similar, and the messaging is consistent across the poster. So that's restaurant food services. We have a similar set for vehicle sales and service. So you can see there's a car in the background. Here's our hand with a rash, healthy skin have it looked at, personal protective equipment, keep it clean, and avoid exposures. So we have a third series for hairdressers. And what's really nice, there's actually on the Workplace Safety and Prevention Services website, that electronic template is there. So the words are embedded in the template, but you can take that template and you can put in whatever pictures you want that are specific to your sector. Because no matter what the feedback is, it has to be sector specific. So when we took those restaurant food services pictures out to the restaurant food services advisory group, one of them said, but that's, that's not our restaurant. And so, no, no, but, but it's interesting because there are fine dining establishments and fast food restaurants, and their kitchens look different. So because we didn't have the right type of kitchen on the poster, they said, well, our workers won't identify with that kitchen. But that's important because that tells us the specificity is important. So we want the consistency of the basic messages, but we have to be able to make it highly specific to the workplace for the workers to recognize it's theirs. So as I said, the electronic uh, template is available. You can take it, you can swap out any pictures you want. So that's our first resource. We're working on some other ones, including um, some training work. So I want to end just going back to that nurse. What did she tell us, that one case? She told us that occupational skin disease is a common problem in healthcare workers. She hadn't received any specific training around it. Specialists didn't make the link, even though she had a clear allergic response. There was no workplace intervention. Her claim was denied, so she wasn't in those statistics. And she does poorly because nobody seems to be aware. So thank you very much for your attention.